thank you all for joining us. Um, as everyone starts trickling in, I'm gonna go over some housekeeping items and then introduce our guest today. If this is the first time you're joining the IC Talks, um, the Society of Professional Journalists International Community hosts these talks that started last year. Our hopes were to connect journalists at a time when it was difficult to do so in person. And since then, um, I think it was just last week, we had our one, week, one year anniversary and we're really excited to continue these talks and expand that our series with experts like the one we have today. Um, just to go over some housekeeping items. Um, for those, if this is your first time joining, um, we have the Q&A feature open. Please make sure if you have any questions to put them into the Q&A feature. I will keep my eye on them and I will weave them into our conversation. If you would like me to ask the questions for you, please make sure to let me know. Otherwise, we will unmute you and you can ask the question directly. Um, we also have the chat feature open. Um, that's where my co-chair, Dan Kubiski will keep his eyes open there for any technical questions you may have or issues, please make sure to direct them there. Also, Dan will be posting any relevant links that we will that will be pertinent to the conversation that you can look at, then you can keep your eye on that for, you know, looking at those links and being a part of the conversation. So us today of the CPJ Emergencies Director, Maria salazar Faro. Maria uh, joins us as the director of the CPJ's Emergencies Department as of October 2016, she oversees the CPJ's assistance and safety work worldwide. In 2018, she was elected president of the board of the ACOS Alliance, a coalition that was formed in 2015 that improves, that improves protections for freelance journalists. She joined CPJ in 2005 and we're really excited to have her with us today. There's so much going on around the world when it comes to the security of journalists. And we're really excited to discuss that with Maria and what we can do going forward. Maria, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for being here. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Of course, same here. You know, I always like to start our conversations with the journalists that we have and how they started their career and how they got into journalism. But before we get into that knit and grit with you about talking about the emergency situations and security and whatnot, I'd love to know about how you got into the, the industry of security of journalists. Huh. Well, uh, it's, been a, it's been a progression. Um, I have been working at CPJ, as you noted, L at the beginning for a long time. I came in um, wanting to do reporting on Latin America and uh, did years of coverage in the Americas program. So I worked very closely there um, on issues of journalists who were arrested in Cuba and journalists who were murdered in Mexico and <clears throat> really across the region. And from there, I moved on to what was then um, the Journalist Assistance Program at CPJ. So it was the arm of CPJ that was uh, supporting journalists in distress, journalists who could not be helped with advocacy alone. Then um, in 2014, uh, in the summer of 2014, we, you know, we hit the, 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 what is the, what was the peak in the crisis um, in Syria, at least for journalists and what became <coughs> a crisis for um, journal, international journalism around the world, which was the beheading, the public beheading of two um, US journalists who were two US freelance journalists who had gone into Syria to cover the war there. Um, so, CPJ staff, along with uh, our wider community, felt that we needed to do something more than um, what was being done to support freelance journalists and to support, in general, the industry with additional safety support. And that's where the emergencies department came into play. That's how we developed the emergencies department. And it was sort of a natural progress to go from uh, reactively supporting journalists to creating something more holistic which is what we have uh, today. And today, we, and I think we'll talk a little bit more about this, what CPG's emergencies program or department does is we provide a continuum of safety support to journalists from the beginning or from, you know, from a very uh, proactive um, response. We give information, we give tools for journalists to think about how to stay safe, to think about risk assessment, to think about how to mitigate the, the risks of any story, 
Um, and then we provide support if that mitigation uh, was not sufficient uh, and can help journalists with a variety of financial and non-financial tools to get them out of a crisis situation. So I don't know how sexy that story was, but that's how I got into the, the world of uh, security and journalism. You know, it's, it's, I'm sure it's not an easy thing to deal with because it's so <laughs> dynamic and we're changing. I, I remember we spoke last week and ever, and since last week, I, I, I remember mentioning I'm pretty sure when we talk, there's gonna be something very relevant and timely that we're gonna be discussing. And here we are, the situation with Belarus. I'd love to talk to you about that. And what CPJ is, what's the stance with CPJ with the Belarus situation? And what do we need to think about as journalists when we see situations like the plane being rerouted and just what the world needs to understand about why this is a very risky and uh, a situation that we need to be aware of. Well, I can tell you in all the time that I've been doing this, I've never, this is the, the first time I've encountered something like this. Um, it was so, and when talking, you know, I mean, on so many levels, it was it was unexpected. When talking about risk mitigation, um, I know that earlier we, we, were, we were joking, you, you're gonna have to think about the flight plan when you're thinking about your risk assessment, but in reality, there was no way to plan for this, for something like this happening. Um, and, you know, I there there's a there's a lot of crazy stuff that that's happened, but I've I've never seen an attack like this on on a journalist. I think there are other things to think about beyond um, mitigation and beyond how this happened. And it's um, uh, you know, the the increase in hostility toward a uh, journalist around the world, the increase in intolerance from governments from regimes toward any kind of criticism, any kind of journalistic criticism that there's that there's also um the you know this really highlights or continues to highlight the importance of independent journalism and, and different ways of doing journalism this is you know that this is not someone who is a traditional journalist who was writing for a big media outlet per se but rather became known through his work on telegram through publishing news on telegram sharing information on telegram and that's true of so many journalists who are working, who we are working on, particularly journalists who are working in more repressive um, environments where that's the only way to get information out. But that's also a complicated situation because um, again, there's a, there's a lack of training, there's a lack of um, uh, resources and structure to help protect those journalists, to help them think about risk. Um, and uh, it's important, but it's risky. Uh, and then, gosh, I mean, there's so many things to talk about in terms of Belarus, um, but the ongoing protest, I, I'm, you know, I'm willing to bet that very few people around the world have been following the repressive situation in Belarus and the protests that have been going on there. And this is by no means the, the first attack that we've seen or brazen attack that we've seen in journalists working in, in Belarus. Um, because there were there were journalists that were arrested, right? I, I believe there was a female journalist that was arrested in Belarus, it's just from the protests. I mean, there's so much going on there. <clears throat> there's so many journalists who were arrested while covering the protest, you know. And and that actually, I'm glad you mentioned it because um, again, in terms of Belarus, this is something that's been ongoing. But mm -hmm. protests are actually something one of my biggest concerns right, right now for journalist safety around the world, and it's um, their protest, you know. <laughs> As we said, uh, things are changing every day, every week, and there are protests happening in different parts of the world and journalists who are covering these and are getting um, entangled in, in this, you know, th this developing civil unrest. Um, and just like we're seeing um, protesters from around the world who are sharing protesting techniques, you know, from the umbrellas in Hong Kong that were used in other parts of the world in Chile. And I heard of them being used in the United States as well. There's also repression that's being shared on how to silence journalists or how to silence anyone who's giving any kind of critical uh, coverage of those protests. So um, again, we're, we were we were seeing massive numbers of attacks in Belarus and legal threats um, to journalists working there, journalists who were being forced to leave their homes, as is this case. Again, something else in this case beyond the crazy story of a plane being hijacked and, so, and a journalist being forced out to give a confession on video, um, I mean, it really highlights 
a lot of trends around the world. So how many journalists are forced to operate from outside their country in order to be able to report what's happening in there and what the threats to those journalists are, even though they fled their countries. Right, and then there was also the story about, uh, what was it just recently, the journalists in Myanmar and very similar, not the flight being rerouted, but being taken off of the flight. So what is CPJ, are there any recommendations that CPJ is having for journalists how to think about these kinds of risks going forward, seeing that this may be a precedent in how we can cover areas maybe we're not located in, but we want to go and fly to? I mean, is that going to change how we maneuver as journalists and how we cover certain situations and regions? I don't know. I mean, again, when talking about Belarus, that's just, yeah. I have no other word that that's insane. Right. Uh, but if we're looking at the case of um, Danny Fenster in Myanmar, so Danny uh, is a U.S. journalist who was working for an independent outlet uh, based in Myanmar and was arrested while at the airport about to board an international flight. Uh, and this is nothing, this is, this is not really something that's new, you know, this is something that we would and that we do recommend any journalist traveling address in their, in their risk assessment uh, planning. Uh, in fact, we saw we we saw this pretty frequently happening, you know, a couple of years ago to journalists who were coming to the United States, either who were getting taken off planes before they were coming to the United States because of new visa regulations, or were being um, taken uh, to additional security once they landed in the U.S. So we have we always recommend that you think about your travel when you're thinking about. Uh, risk mitigation um, and border crossing is always one of the riskiest things that you can do. Um, so you need to be thinking about what you're going to do. Uh, if there's a possibility of arrest, have an emergency contact, have a lawyer at the ready. Um, and another thing that you need to think about when crossing borders is how to protect the information that you're bringing with you across that border, the equipment that you're bringing with you. And lastly, I will say, um, I think it's very important, especially to young journalists and to folks who are using mostly social media is how you present yourself on social media and what kind of information you give about yourself there that can be used um, or that can easily be found when trying to cross a border. Um, so your social media footprint is, is a very important component of your uh, risk assessment. Right. You know, you mentioned earlier about protests, and I think that's so important to kind of cover that because here in the United States last year was just one after another. We're seeing so many protests happening, not just, I mean, not just in the U.S., it was happening all over the world. But I feel as if because we it wasn't so prevalent in the U.S., it almost seems as if journalists that were here in the U.S. couldn't anticipate or to the situation that was un, unfolding, right? What was the CPJ, what was the reaction to what was happening last year when, it, when we saw this influx of protests in the US? What was the reaction to that and what was the mitigated steps afterwards? So, uh, I mean, this is a very interesting question because um, I'm telling you the story of how we created the emergencies department. It was um, when we started thinking about this, we always saw it as sort of a, a support that we were gonna to give to either journalists working in very risk, risky environments or journalists traveling to those risky environments. And um, we had to do a 180, a complete pivot uh, to, to report and support journalists in the United States. And here I'm just, I mean, Ellie, you and I go back a, a while and we had actually been talking a lot before the election about journalist safety and how to support journalists covering the election because it wasn't, you know, Safety around the presidential election last year wasn't something that came out of the blue. We were concerned. We were concerned about what that was going to mean to journalists working here because of the very um, because of the intense anti-press rhetoric that was that that was going on at the time. What we didn't anticipate was um, the pandemic, obviously, and um, how also the the pandemic and so and a lot of uh, social tensions in the in the United States would exacerbate that situation for journalists. Um, interestingly, we, ahead of the election, we had surveyed or we had attempted to survey journalists covering politics around the United States to understand what their safety concerns were and what kind of access they had to safety resources. And there seemed to be general, um, a general lack of interest or concern around safety and 
uh, working in the United States, mostly political coverage. Um, and sure enough, when the protest um, erupted and uh, we started to see more and more journalists get tangled up in the protests, more and more attacks. I mean, the number of attacks was something we hadn't seen since maybe the Arab Springs. You know, like we hadn't we hadn't seen that many journalists be arrested, um, physically attacked, intimidated since then. And um, there was a complete lack of preparation. I mean, again, it was just. It was the moment, but a lot of local journalists were being thrown out to cover what was a very high risk uh, story without the preparation to cover that story. Uh, and it's funny. It was like, mentioned, like, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mentioned that. And I last year I worked with a journalist named Tim Myers for BBC Peace, and he ended up covering the, the protests in DC. And he was a part of, um, he actually came onto our talks. And um, he mentioned about what it was like to cover the DC protests. He was actually attacked by the police and it turned into, you know, this conversation with the Senate and it just went up the ranks because talking about what are we doing with journalists and their protection and the attacks against them. I mean, and that comes from someone who, Tim, who I've worked with and, you know, we didn't anticipate, although we've been abroad and we've seen those things abroad, we just didn't anticipate that to be here, you know? And you're totally, absolutely correct about that. I, I, can't, I can't imagine as US journalists based inside the US, how could they ever think about, you know, doing a risk assessment when, you know, it was never really prevalent as like you would see abroad, right? So having said that, is there something that you would, what would you recommend to journalists, maybe up and coming journalists or freelance journalists, especially what kind of mistakes are they making when it comes to covering these certain regions or stories and what could they do to mitigate that? I mean, I know what I would say at first, but I'm curious to see what, from your experience, what, what, what is that mistake and how can they mitigate that? I mean, I wonder if we would say the same thing, but um, I, I guess the first thing I would say is not the, the all the security concerns and all the security mitigation should never be just on the journalist and should never be on that single person. It should be the anything to do with, with uh, risk and security. And I wanna emphasize, you should think about risk and security for every story you're covering, no matter how mundane the story may be. Um, if you're working in journalism, you need to be thinking about that. But I think the first thing is to make sure that the editor that you're working with, unless you're, you know, you're really working on spec, um, you should make sure that you're having a conversation with that editor and that editor understands what the security uh, concerns are and the, what kind of mitigation needs to be put in place. Um, the editor, any other person in the reporting team should be um, immersed in that conversation and risk assessment should be a conversation. It should not be uh, just filling out a bunch of paperwork and, and being done with it. So that's, that's the first mistake that I, that I would emphasize. A uh, risk assessment should not be just paperwork. It should be something active, something engaging, and something that develops with the story. Um, preparation is another thing, you know. A second mistake is not knowing uh, what you're going to go cover and how, like what every potential angle to that story could become a, an issue. And I think, oh, this is something else that we've talked about in the past. And that's like, for, to give an example, the identity of anyone in the reporting team. Um, if you're gonna go cover, um, you know, a far right protest, um, how is, and you're gonna bring a, uh, a Latina female identifying journalist, how is that going to put you in a different situation of risk that if you're that the, and I'm sorry about my crazy children outside. Um, <laughs> yeah. How is that going to change the security assessment that you're doing at the risk mitigation that if the journalist is a white male, um, just to give you an example of identity. Uh, but beyond that kind of preparation, you should always know the location, what exit routes are. You should never ever find yourself in a situation in which you can't get out of that situation. Uh, and you should understand who the different players um, or you know stakeholders in a particular story or situation may be. So again, information, preparation. Um, and within preparation, there are other things like training. Um, when possible, if possible, you should have training or 
Um, it, and it doesn't have to be, you know, a proper military HIFAT in which you have a mock, uh, you know, uh, kidnapping. There are lots of other ways to get training and lots of ways to get training that's free or that's very low cost and very effective um, and have other types of mitigation in place. But all of this comes back to preparation and that conversation. Those would be the, the, the biggest tips I can say. Ah, and the last one. You can learn from colleagues. You can learn, it's so important to always, don't work alone, work with colleagues, especially other people who may, or who probably have more experience than you, who have covered other similar situations and who can tell you about their mistakes and how they mitigate risk. Right, right. And so I'd love to talk about more, um... Last year with the pandemic, we found a lot of people were kind of stuck in the regions that we were in. So going to different places, just the, the formula for doing this journalism work had changed a little bit. And it makes me think that um, online and social risk assessments and approaching the story is very important and something that maybe a lot, not a lot of people thought about. From your experience with CPJ, have you? What are some things that you have seen in the last year during the pandemic when it comes to approaching the story, digital safety th tips that you may have? Like, for example, you know, we've had speakers like Radaways who was based with Al Jazeera, and they had she had a massive online doxing that was happening to her. And that was based like a digital security situation, right? And we're seeing that a lot with especially females, you know, I, I don't wanna pinpoint that, but it's, it's hard not to. And so what are some things at CPJ and that you've seen the last year, especially that people can think about as journalists when they're approaching stories, when they're not physically able to get there, but have to approach it from a digital perspective? Well, first of all, you're not wrong. Um, digital safety or mo mostly online harassment and online threats are, are really common for a female journalist and other journalists um, who, you know, are in a religious or ethnic minority. That's, that's the, you know, it's a lot more common for these type, these journalists to receive um, online threats. Um, and, you know, throughout the pandemic, we've seen different types of things. You know, people are stuck at home, they're sharing computers, so computers may not be safe. So um, it's just always important to make sure that the computer that you're using is as safe as can be. And it's not that hard. We're talking about password protection, you know, password manager, making sure that your antivirus is up to date. It's kind of boring stuff, but it's stuff that you should be thinking about because that's going to take you know, get you a long, long way in terms of securing uh, your communications, as well as trying to use a VPN um, to make sure that you're protecting your on, your online traffic. Um, but when talking about online harassment and digital threat, it's it's people do seem to be aware of it right now, but it's something that's been happening for a long time. And it's also important for us to think about digital security. Uh, not as something that's siloed from other types of security, but the way I try to think about it is like a, a continuum in, in which one feeds into the other, into the other, and there are three buckets that we always think about. So there's your traditional physical security. Um, what helmet do you need to wear when you're going to cover a protest? What kind of um, other PP, personal protective equipment do you need to be carrying? Um, how do you know if you're being followed? That that you know that sort of physical security tradition, the, the, the way that we tend to think traditionally about security. Then there's the digital security component that is always changing. So that one's one where you need to be thinking about how it's changing, how it pertains to you, what new threats are happening, and I'll um, you know. I, we are always tracking those and always updating the information that we have. So that's a really handy tool for you. Come to our website and, and look at what we're, what we're investigating and how we're thinking about mitigation. But so in there, we have what we've already talked about. So equipment, uh, information, and social media protection. And then there's one that I, I would say Elle, is the one that's come up most often lately um, in terms of security and a lot of interest around, which is, um, Psych what we call psychosocial safety. Mm 
And we talk about this as safety because we want to think about it again within that continuum and within something that you can be doing ahead of time that you can be preparing for and not only responding to. And within that category, it's a lot of things around mental health and certainly trauma, PTSD, um, and all those link together because around online harassment, you know, one of the biggest threats that you have is how that's going to affect you psychologically. If you're sitting there and you're receiving a barrage of horrible things about yourself, of, of people like just right. people all over the place sending you horrible messages, that's going to really affect you. Obviously, that can then in turn become a, a physical security threat. And doxing certainly can become a very serious physical security threat. And doxing is when your personal information is shared on the, online and anyone has access to your address, bank accounts, um, that sort of thing. Uh, but um, so, so that continuum is really important to be thinking about. And I think a silver lining of the pandemic and the kind of work and reporting that we've been having to do is that people are thinking a lot more about digital security and psychosocial security and where those fall within a risk assessment and within a story, which wasn't so true um, maybe before uh, we were all locked down. Right. And, you know, we've also had Maria Ressa on our talks and I can't, I keep thinking of Maria and Lada and the different women that we've had on. And I can't help to think, I definitely want to get your perspective on women in journalism and the risks that they're, that come across women in journalism and the work that they're doing. And is it, what is CPJ doing in regards to looking into the matter of the safety for women in journalism, whether it's digital, physical, what can, what are, what are you guys seeing in this year coming out of the pandemic and what have you seen in the last few years? I mean, I think it's a, a subject matter that really resonates with me and I always think about when we have the women that speak with us to talk about the things that are happening to them and what obstacles they have in their reporting. And I'm always curious to hear what all organizations are doing to help mitigate that. And since CPJ is in the, in the heart of the, the risk assessments and making sure to for safety in general, like what are some things that CPJ is looking into in regards to that? I mean, it's something we've also been looking uh, into for for a long, long time. Um, and I could also talk to you, we could have a whole talk about this, just about this. And there's so many ways in which we can be talking about female journalists and the security issues that they face. Uh, right now, for me, the biggest one, again, the one that we need to be thinking about the most um, is is online harassment and, and threat to female journalists on the internet. Um, on social media, on their email, et cetera. It's something that we're seeing everywhere. Um, so I want to say three years ago, we did we did a specific uh, research project in which we spent spent months interviewing uh, female and gender non or female identifying and gender non-conforming journalists working in the United States to understand what their safety concerns were and what their needs were. Um, and so online harassment was the biggest one. But we've also seen that it. it's it's a real, real serious ongoing issue in um, in India. Actually, India is sort of like an incubator for online threats. You see them first in India, and then they come to the rest of the world. Uh, we've seen it in Brazil. We've seen it obviously, as you you know you you mentioned um, in the Philippines. We're seeing it in Italy and South Africa. It's a very easy way to to attack women and to use very. I'm going to be honest, ridiculous, low-hanging fruit to attack them, sexualize them, attack their family. And now that we're going to talk about families, we're, when we're if we take it out of this context of people, you know, using social media or using the internet to, to report and to, and to publish, um, and we go back to thinking about journalists who are forced to leave their countries, which is um, another huge way of silencing the press, forcing them out. Often, one, one terrible way that women journalists are affected is that they're often responsible for their families, much more often than, than their male counterparts. So they can't leave their children, they can't leave their, fam their parents, they can't leave their families, and that puts them in a completely different kind of bind than a, a male who can leave. Um, and then, of course, there's a lot of the, the 
other issues that we've encountered since the Arab Springs or that have come like that have been talked about a lot since the Arab Springs, which is sexualized violence and female journalists uh, doing solo reporting and how those attacks can can be can be more more common and the thing is no matter where you are female journalists all these issues are going you're going to see those trends um picked up all over the world um to because again talking about identity and safety uh the identity of female journalists is always gonna you know hit that extra nerve with people in power <laughs> not to sound too not to generalize too much but but yes to generalize that much right I just want to remind those that are attending, if you have any questions for Maria, please feel free to put them in the Q&A section. We'll make sure you're able to ask them directly. Um, we're about hit the halfway mark, so make sure to get those in when you can. Um, I'd like to kind of tap onto the psychosocial safety because that for me, I've realized, especially this last year, has become something I think in the industry we don't really pay too much attention to, but it's coming to the surface now. We can't really ignore it as much anymore or uh, paint that picture of, well, just deal with it. Um, are you seeing, what, what recommendations would you have for journalists that either feel the burnout or maybe going through um, potential PTSD from the work that they're doing? What other resources are out there that you would recommend for them to look into? And what kind of conversations maybe they can have with their newsrooms or their editors in order to make sure that that's part of the conversation? And again, I think the, the biggest thing is to be able to talk about it. And I, and again, a silver lining of a lot of the stuff that we've been seeing is that more and more journalists are able to to talk about it, to openly talk about it. And that taboo is sort of disappearing in the newsroom. Um, so that, that's the first thing. Uh, the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma, I would say, is my go-to place or the go-to place uh, for anyone who is seeking uh more resources on a variety of mental health uh, and journalism related issues. We have some, we also have safety information. Again, we like to think of it, of it as a preparedness and how to, how to risk assess uh, around these issues. Uh, and we have some general information as well as a lot of de well-developed information around online harassment and how that can affect you. Um, but, you know, some of the, the most usual, uh, or the, yes, the, the most common tips that um, can be shared, I, I'd echo those. And it's, um, this, aside from being able to talk about it, to find somebody who you can talk to, whether that's a colleague, an editor, or a friend who you feel that you can talk to, that you can reach out to. Therapy, you know, that, again, that the, the idea of talking about therapy is not, no longer taboo, and many journalists uh, could uh, use and benefit from it. We have grants. CPJ has emergency grants for folks who can't cover their therapy, and the the you know the the resources they need are related to their journalism, to their work as journalists. Um, and uh, again, there there's there's a variety of resources out there that help you uh, think about how to alleviate burnout um, and uh how to how to cope with all this with these situations are you seeing newsrooms are becoming more aware of this issue and in having those difficult conversations with journalists or is it still kind of you know oh my god yes it's been and i don't want to say that it's only that it's it's only been because of covid these conversations i've been having these conversations more and more with different newsrooms in different parts of the world which is you know yeah. extra exciting because we're not talking about western uh countries and big newsrooms in western countries it's something that's coming up in a lot of a lot of places where we work uh and definitely i think i want to say it's a generational thing you know i think younger journalists are a lot more willing to address it a lot more willing to ask for support and that's forcing newsrooms and forcing editors um to to have those conversations um i definitely think that when we're talking about uh the U.S., for instance, or, or some journalists who are working in Europe, seeing, you know, seeing the story, the, devast the a devastating story, a high risk story happen in their own backyard, that has also have 
has 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 also had um, a different type of consequence in talking about uh, mental health, because often you know the, the the issue of mental health in journalism was equated with somebody having to go somewhere where a situation was terrible and witness that situation, and then the idea was you come back, you debrief, you take some time off, and then you can start up. But when you're not able to do that, you're having to address or newsrooms and uh, journalists in general or communities having to address deeper rooted issues around um, around mental health and journalism. And again, in the United States in the last year, I've seen that conversation happen a lot, not only around COVID, because I think, you know, obviously that's a community wide conversation that's happening. And that's interesting how the implications it's going to have on journalism, but also around race. And around um, the the you know the social movement that's been happening in the U.S. and that that has also been really interesting to to witness um, not only in terms of psychosocial safety but in terms of thinking about how we work as journalists uh, here in the U.S. Awesome. You know, um, I wanted to get your feedback and to see what CPJ is thinking about with immediate things that are coming up for journalists, whether like for me, I'm thinking about elections that are coming up abroad, right? Um, is that something that it's on your radar as CPJ? And what are some tips that you would have for journalists that are looking to cover, like for example, the elections in Iran or other locations? Can you give us an idea of, of what's on your radar, which countries and what's the, the protocol for staying safe when doing those, that kind of coverage? So elections are some of my favorite um, security uh, stories because uh, journalists who are covering elections are a lot more security um, aware. They, you know, they're they they're usually are in most elections. There, there's an uptick in threats or attacks, whether you're they're physical covering a rally or online, you know, but so newsrooms and journalists tend to, oh, we're gonna, but there's an election coming up. We have to think about security. So this is a great way for me to come in and talk about security in general. So I love elections. But with that in mind, they, they are a moment that's a lot riskier for journalists. Um, and again, to go back to, this, to the US story, um, you may think that it's gonna be a few people who are gonna to have to cover the election story. And all of a sudden the election story becomes an, a story that most of the newsroom is going to have to cover. Um, we've been, the, my, the emergencies team has been working on elections for a while. And we've gone, we have toolkits, a general toolkit with loads of information. Again, in the, the three buckets as we call them of security, but also information that's specific to editors, information that's specific to photographers. Cause we haven't talked about photographers and the, the very, very um, intense threats that photographers face uh, and we cover and and then we do some deep dives into elections that we we uh, feel are going to be particularly dangerous for journalists so we've gone into South Africa and India we did obviously we did the US um, <clears throat> we did Guatemala in Brazil and now we are looking this year we're preparing for <clears throat> Mexico elections are upcoming that you know given the very violent history for journalists covering Mexico and how violent the past round of elections in general is in Mexico, we're concerned about those. And then we have also, as you mentioned, Iran, that's that's upcoming. Um, you know, that that's Iran, uh, Iranian elections are always tricky uh, in that who, you know, what foreign journalists are gonna be able to come in and what that's going to- um, Nice screen share. Thanks, yeah. Dan. So you're showing well, a list of the countries um, right now that have elections coming up? Oh gosh, oh. you're giving me anxiety because all these are... <laughs> but Hilarious. we also have, we have Ethiopia as well, but they announced that they're going to have elections in less than a month. And given the situation, I mean, they in the last, what, two months, they've kicked out the LA Times correspondent and the New York Times correspondent. So if, they're, if authorities are willing and so brazen as to do that, what's happening to local journalists who are covering election or who are covering the the, the conflict in Tigray. Um, anyway, so we have toolkits for those specific elections um, that I welcome everyone to check out and to um, right. use. Mm 
So basically CPJ is prepared for all situations. And I love you guys for that, that. Except plane hijackings. We're, we weren't, oh. we're adding that to our list, but we weren't quite prepared for that yet. Wow. So when something like that happens, what's the process of, okay, it's on our radar now, right? Now? Like what, what can we think about now as journalists we're boarding flights? Is it something that, like we mentioned earlier, we think about the, the flight plan? I mean, like how do we even go about thinking about mitigating those risks? I don't know that you can mitigate for, again, for a plane hijacking, but but you, you can definitely think about uh, emergency contacts, uh, having an, a lawyer on hand. Uh, and again, I mean, in this particular situation, gosh, I really don't know. I mean, because they weren't, they got diverted into, into Belarusian airspace, so. Right, that's wild. But I, so we have one more thing that's coming up this year that's been in the news, it's with the Olympics, it's kind of like a big change. Is there? Are you guys, is that on your radar when it comes to the journalists that are covering like this big sporting event? And what are some things that you're thinking about? I mean, if it decides to happen, I mean, there's lots of conflicting conversations about it, right? Right. Um, And you sort of caught me off guard because we've been uh, thinking about so many political events and so many uh, other crises around the world that um, we I haven't talked about the Olympics actually. We do usually, uh, Olympics are usually one of those uh, events that, that, we're, that, that we focus on. And depending on where they are, uh, we will also develop specific information and advice for, for journalists who may be covering it. Sports are, you, you'd, you'd be surprised how hostile sports coverage can be. Uh, both it brings person. all the world together, but then, it, like you said, it can be very hostile just covering it, right? The, oh the- yeah, both in person and online. Um, specifically, if you're a woman covering sports, um, you'll definitely get lots of um, attention. Probably unwanted attention. I know that, said that the U.S. government's recommending people not to go to Japan. Interesting. Have you been it's- getting any information about? you know, countries that are deciding not to go, um, what to think about if a journalist, maybe as a freelancer decides to go, has permission to go? Well, I think the recommendation right now from the US government is COVID related. And uh, it's because of the recent uptick in cases in Japan that the US government's recommending that that journalists not go. Uh, I mean, Japan is not a place where we're we're particularly concerned for, for journalists, but in other cases, like, when um, sporting, big sporting events have been held in places like Russia or China, we will be thinking about mostly about digital safety, but also about um, surveillance, also right. digital sur- safety in a way, um, and other kinds of safety precautions and definitely about risk assessments. But again, in places like Russia or China, their accreditation process will be complicated. And um, obviously, this is when thinking about something like the Olympic CPJ is not only thinking from from my very practical side of the operation, but our advocacy team is also often very engaged with the Olympic Committee or with FIFA or with um, organizers to make sure that there's uh, contingency plans in place for journalists, that there's specific safety um, plans in place for journalists, hotlines, that sort of thing, so that um, uh, journalists are allowed to cover the event and any political uh, or any other kind of story that might be surrounding that event. Right. So is there anything that, if, whether it's region-wise or topic-wise, that you think isn't getting the proper attention when it comes to journalists, safety, and maybe both of those put together, that um, maybe it's been on your radar, but maybe you wish the public would know more about? Oh, there's so many stories that are on our radar and that I wish would get some 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 more attention. Um, lately, we've been uh, very focused. Um, if it's not the children, it's New York City street noise. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, we've been working with journalists in Haiti. Like as we've mentioned throughout this conversation, there are ongoing protests around the world uh, and. The, there have been a lot of really violent protests in Haiti. Um, journalists have been injured. Uh, journalists who have been critical of one side or another have s- received um, 
pretty significant threats. Uh, so, you know, that story, I think, is a story that's worth keeping an eye on and that has not um, gained that much attention. But in general, you know, like, if you're looking at the international media, again, Ethiopia, I don't know if it's getting that much attention. I don't even know if Iran's getting that much attention because lately we've all been in the in the COVID uh, vortex, in the vaccine vortex that actually, you know, gives great cover for anyone who wants uh, who wants a very tricky story silenced. Um, and Right. I think there's a lot of there are a lot of stories that are probably going unreported and a lot of issues that are that are being overlooked because of this global um, this very you know this hugely important global story. Right. I can agree with you more. You know. So before we're nearing towards the end of our conversation, so if there's any questions that anyone may have, please make sure to put them into the Q and A. I'll make sure that Maria gets to answer them for you. But usually what we do at the end of our conversations, we always ask our guests uh, what press freedom means to them. So I'd love to know, Maria, someone who has been in the knit and grit of everything regarding safety of journalists for so many years, and you've seen so much and heard so much, what does press freedom mean to you? Um, so I think press freedom is really at the heart of you know, press freedom is enshrined as a as a universal human right. Um, but I, for me, I think press freedom is at the heart of all other rights and other freedoms that we have. Because without access to information, without access to independent and easy to, easy to access and understand information, we can't make any kind of decision. We can't. It's you know. We, d we don't have access to other rights. We, it's hard to know, um, uh, to understand politics. It's hard to understand health. It's hard to understand um, uh, climate. Uh, uh, so to me, that is at the heart of, of all other rights and at the heart of any democratic society, at the heart of having informed um, people who are able to make decisions and also in, to not, on, not only inform people who are able to make decisions, sorry, I'm, it's a convoluted answer, but um, also giving voice to different parts of a society, making sure that um, those who may not have those voices, whose stories may not be heard, can, uh, can be heard and can understand other stories as well, just as, you know, just as your last question emphasized. Yeah. And is there anything that you want to add that we may not have discussed that you think is important for the audience and just our audience in general that are going to view this afterwards to be aware of, um, whether it's regarding CPJ, potential story ideas, things to think about with risk assessments, et cetera? Actually, I think if there was one last thing that I would want to add, it wouldn't necessarily be around what I do, but it would be around what other but some of my other colleagues do, and that would be the importance of, of journalists standing up for other journalists. CPJ was founded as a group of journalists who wanted to do something for a colleague who had been arrested. And to this day, our, we certainly have all our security resources um, available, but what we think is most important is using journalism to protect journalists and using the tools of journalism to protect journalists. Um, and sometimes um, that's forgotten. So I think it's so important for us as journalists to speak up on behalf of other journalists and uh, to cover those stories and to make sure again, that all those voices and that all those stories can continue to be told. And um, uh, in that way, we're protecting the work that our more threatened colleagues are doing. I can't think of a better way to end our conversation. It went by so quickly. Maria, I could talk to you for hours, you know. Um, I enjoy you so much. I, I hold you in such high regard and the work that you're doing is so admirable. And I hope that um, we can have you back again um, and discuss more things that are coming up um, maybe later on this year. Um, I mean, we made a list of possible other talks, right? I'll, I, I, I really do look forward to coming back and, and continuing this conversation. I feel like I could have a series with you and we can discuss everything and we can do that for hours and hours. Thank um, you. And thank you all for joining us today for the links and the conversation that we had um, 
Dan did include those links in our comment section or chat section. We will be sure to include that in our weekly um, newsletter that goes out to those that signed up. You will be signed up to our newsletter. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Maria. Uh, we have a few more conversations that are coming up in the coming weeks. We will be sure to announce them in our newsletter. So keep your um, eyes open for, the, for that email that comes out. And we hope that you continue to join us and to have these conversations. And we look forward to having Maria back sometime soon too. Thank so, you so much. Thank you, Maria. And thank you all for joining us.